Let's start where we should start. How about Anthony? Fantastic How about Anthony? job, Anthony. Great job, my man. <laughs> Ernie Els never flustered, always. When it's on the line and the pressure is deep, he takes care of business every single time. How'd you start that playoff in 1994 at the U.S. <laughs> Open? Well, you say I wasn't flustered. I think I was. <laughs> I, uh, 1994, obviously, um, you know, the great Arnold Palmer, you know, he uh, retired from U.S. Open golf there. And what a week, you know, it was my second U.S. Open. Um, you know, I finished seventh the year before to get into this 94 U.S. Open. But um, um, had a wonderful week. Um, on the Sunday, you know, things went a little awry when I started hitting the ball left a bit on 18 and so forth. Actually ended up making a five-footer just to get into the playoff for Monday. And then I'm feeling good on Monday. And then I start off with a bogey on uh, number one at Oakmont. It's pretty tough hole, so I'm like, okay. Then the second hole's probably regarded as the easiest hole at Oakmont. And I make seven there. <laughs> So four over through two. Still working. So there was a lot of uh, negative <laughs> thoughts going on there, Anthony, I promise you. <laughs> but able to work your way back in a very popular victory. I'm not sure the folks in this country really understood what you were all about at that point. Why was it so difficult for foreign-born players to get into the U.S. Open in those days? Well, just to qualify. I mean, you had to be in the top 50 in, in the world. Um, you've had to have won a tournament on the PGA Tour or... Uh, you have had to have done something really good. In my case, um, I got into the 1993 um, US Open through the 92 British Open. I know there's a lot of things going on here, but I finished uh, fifth at the Open Championship in 92 at Muirfield. That gave me an opportunity to play in the US Open and the next year's Open Championship. So in 93, um, Baltus role, I gotta thank Lee Jansen. Okay. You talk about getting good breaks. Played at Baltus role and they have the 10 shot rule and um, through two rounds, if, if you're within 10 shots, you know, you, you make the cut. And if Lee Jansen makes a six footer on 18 on Friday, you probably never hear from me ever <laughs> again. <laughs> We'd have heard from him Because he again. missed that putt and I got into the um, weekend and then I played a fantastic weekend at finished seventh. And that got me into 94. And then I won 94. So all these things, you know, add up. But not the first win in the United States for Ernie Els. Tell me about the first time you beat Phil Mickelson. Well, you saw the pictures. Didn't no, you? I'm going all, <laughs> wait, yeah, exactly. The Junior Worlds. We that was in 84. Back. Yeah. Was it 84? Yeah, I think it was 84. Oh, so. I'm going Junior Worlds. 84? That's 1984 Junior Worlds. Oh, wow. That was in his hometown, so that felt good. <laughs> <laughs> I know Phil's not yet to defend himself, but it, you know, it was nice. Look, folks, you can see all the videos you want and go through, watch all the old Golf Channel shows, you'll see his swing, you'll hear about all the accolades. But just a peek behind the curtain, when I first started at Golf Channel, there were a couple of guys, and it seemed like, frankly, there were just about all of them South Africans, that the other reporters would say, hey, go get a sound bite from so-and-so. Ernie Els was always there because he was, a few years previous, I won't tell the whole story, he went out of his way to be very kind to me a couple of months before my dad passed away. And I could relay his words onto my father and really buoyed my, spirit, my father's spirits before he passed. So I've always been an Ernie Els fan. But when I started working at the Golf Channel, they said it's, it's not just what he says, but how he says it. Always calls it cuzzy. You always feel like you're a friend or a pal or a cousin of his. And so he was so accessible to all of us in a time when... Frankly, Tiger Woods is coming up, not so accessible, and maybe that was sort of how things seem to be going. Norman wasn't necessarily so accessible. Maybe I shouldn't be naming names, but you were someone that really could share <laughs> all that was going on in the game of golf and really helped us. Why did you do that? Well, thank you for saying that, Dave. I mean, I always felt very fortunate to, to be in that kind of position, you know, uh, to be able to play on the US PGA Tour at a very young age. I mean, um, I was brought up in South Africa uh, by a pretty serious father. I had an older brother and an older sister, so they slapped me around for a long time. You? So maybe, oh yeah, my brother is, you know, all these stories about me, it's, 
relative, when you meet my brother, he's the real tough guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, my dad was a, had a trucking business, so he was away from home a lot. Um, built up his business, uh, you know, during the 80s. And, and I think, um, obviously, his discipline and my grandfather, um, who really brought the game into our household, my dad never played the game, never even knew that he was a good golfer until my grandfather took him to the golf course when my dad was in his 20s mm -hmm. and became a very good golfer. He was a one handicap within three years. So that's where the talent lay, and he never knew about it. But what I'm trying to say is that I think it, it comes from, you know, we heard about how great this game of golf is, and it's true. You know, it, it teaches you values, you know. We have a great junior program in South Africa, amateur program. We have had golf tournaments on a junior level when I started playing, which is well, close to 50 years ago <laughs> now. Those tournaments already had a 50-year history. You know what I'm saying? So golf has come a long way in South Africa, and the etiquette and uh, playing to the rules of the game was, was always instilled in us, and I think that parlays into your life, which has happened in so many different ways we've seen tonight again. And I think um, me being as a foreigner, you know, you got to be friendly to you guys. You know, I mean, yeah. this is where my future was going to be. Um, you know, and, you know, just the way it, it, it kind of happened. But um, I enjoyed the time when you were there. You know, we had a good time. I mean, I remember Scott Van Pelt, who's a big time ESPN guy now. But Scott was there in the early days. and. Love to banter with Scott. I still banter with him. You know, I have a couple of wines at night and I'll text him on his show. <laughs> <laughs> um, thankfully, he keeps me off the show, so that's good. Van Pelt but, does the best Ernie Els imitation also. If you ever see him, pull him aside. He's perfect. Uh, got you spot on as far as that's concerned. It reminds me a little bit of Arnold. We've been talking about your association with Arnold Palmer and, and how you know, your accessibility to the fans, similar to Arnold's as well. His father, tough taskmaster, a man in the game of golf, but his mother, Doris, was just a sweet, wonderful lady, kind of gave the personality to Arnold. I guess you got yours from the game, maybe some from your mom as well. But let's talk about when you came over here and, and started being successful again. You were nice to us at the start. You became the big easy. Everyone wanted to hang around with you, but you stayed true to that humble nature that you had from South Africa, like Nick Price has, John Bland, McNulty, I can go run through a hundred of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. You have, you've got to have a mentor out there. And I, um, I latched myself onto Nick Price, poor guy. <laughs> you know, um, I knew Nick Price from the early 80s. Price, he won the World Series of Golf mm -hmm. in 83. And for me to go to San Diego in 84, where I eventually won that tournament, I had to win a tournament in South Africa to qualify for that. Wow. So you talk about pressure, you know, knowing that if you win this tournament, you go to San Diego. So at the prize giving, Nick Price showed up. This wow. is in 84. So then now, 10 years later, when I'm the US Open champion and all this, um, I still felt I needed somebody that can show me the ropes, you know, show me not only how to play better golf, but, you know, more about life. You know, he, he told me to move to Orlando, uh, where we, Liesl and myself, had our first house because of David Ledbetter. You know, he was my teacher at that time. Pricey was in Orlando. So, you know, that whole camaraderie, kind of big brother kind of a deal uh, played itself out with Nick Price. And then playing with a guy, I wouldn't say against him, but playing practice rounds with him. In those days, he was good friends with Greg Norman, and, you know, VJ was around, Steve Elkington, these guys, we used to play, you know, kind of money games, and, and they elevated me a little bit to become a better player, and a little bit tougher on the course. So it was a, it was a kind of a, a group effort, and, you know, and Liesl always been with me, and then the kids coming later and, you know, from like 99 and, and then 2002. So it was a, it was a good era for, for us growing up as, as youngsters. I think little brother helped big brother as well because you win the 94 US Open. Nick wins the next two major championships. So clearly seeing you do well at the height where he's number one in the world as well. Loved seeing the two of you, that stretch, doing as well as you did. 
one thing I've always found, be it PGA Tour and Champions Tour, is if you come across a South African golfer, they're not just talented, love the game, great guys, but also all kinds of fun. I don't know how that happens. You've got guys like Tony Johnston. You've got guys like Simon Hobday. Should we bring up Simon Hobday? Hobday? Yeah. You got any I mean, Hobday stories for us? Well, the famous one is, um, you know, Simon, what a guy. Um, they, well, there's a couple, but I'll try and keep it clean. <laughs> but <It's hard. laughs> Simon was one of the best ball strikers you'll ever see. You know, seriously good go uh, uh, ball striker. But, you know, the putts, he was a good putter. He wouldn't three putt, but the, he wouldn't make those big putts, you know, the birdie putts, the, the kind of hero putts. And um, he came over here to play the, the Champions Tour. And in those days, in the 90s, there was a sponsor called Bullet, Bullet Golf. And it was quite loud, you know, the, the clothing they gave the guys, they gave him pink. And Simon Obde was a guy where he, he laundered his own clothing at night in the bathtub. I'm serious. <laughs> and he lined his stuff. But now he's got all this fancy clothing, and I gave him this big hat for this, uh, you know, American son. And he plays five holes of his first tournament on the Champions Tour. And on the sixth hole, he hits another putt, and it just barely goes in. It doesn't quite go in. And he pulls off the hat, and he goes, and I thought you wouldn't recognize me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'll give my Simon Hobday story. I was running a tournament called The Tradition up at Desert Mountain. It was a major championship on the over 50 circuit. And I had cut back the overtime hours for Scottsdale PD. They weren't happy. So there was a road called Pima Road going up to, to Desert Mountain from Scottsdale. And they decided, all the players had white Cadillacs. They decided they're gonna pull over every white Cadillac that goes up there and pay me back. Simon was late for his starting time. He's flying up Pima. It's 30 miles an hour speed limit. It's wide open, there's not a car as far as you can see. SPD lights him up, he pulls over, the, the guy runs up there and says, you know, I've been waiting for you all day. And Simon looks at him and says, got here as quick as I could. <laughs> So that's Simon Hobday, and that tells you a bit about the characters you find in that wonderful part of the world where the South African Golf Tour, the Sunshine Tour, from many years ago, from, uh, from Bruno Brian Henning to many others, created a tour that created these wonderful golfers and the personalities. But it, again, you know, it comes from the roots. You know, the roots were set in place early. Junior golf was there. Mm -hmm. You know, even Gary Player played junior golf in South Africa. I mean, he's 87 today. And so the generations followed. And um, the weather was perfect down in South Africa, most of the places, and you know, you know, kept it up. But also the love and the fun of it. You know, we spent a lot of time outdoors, and um, you know, we have our drinking limit is 18 in South Africa, not 21. So we get introduced to beer and stuff. So we. Hang on. We have Your a good time. And then we, we also did military <laughs> service, so all of these things, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot going on at a very early age in South Africa, so, um, you know, it kind of continues sometimes into adult life. <laughs> but, but the roots grew deeply because there's the saying, to, much, to whom much is given, much is expected, and you were given a lot of talent and a lot of natural ability and all that, and then when life gave you a curveball, sometimes you see how people react and they don't react maybe the way you would hope your heroes or those who you admire would. And when you found out about your son, Ben, and you figured out what was going on with him, you elevated your integrity, let's just say. I mean, you really took the bull by the horns and now $50 million later, that affliction, which afflicts one in 36 young people, is one that you are taking on and you and Liesl doing such a wonderful job. Tell us about the beginnings of that and what it's yielded now. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, so we, um, you know, we got married in 99. Uh, Samantha came shortly after that. Um, perfectly healthy, beautiful girl. She's, uh, she's 24 now. Um, you know, just graduated from Stanford. She's in New York City at the moment, you know. Um, ben came along, you know, in, in two th uh, 2002, October, and um, 
from a very early age, I, we could um, sense that there was something not quite, quite right. Um, well, they all say boys are a little bit slower. We, we all understand that. But, you know, Ben was particularly um, slow to, to, to even start crawling and, and, and so forth. Not a lot of eye contact, all of that. Um, so anyway, this is, this is now 20 years ago. So this is very, uh, very new to us. Went on the web and started checking it out. And all the boxes that we checked detect you know, uh, autism. And um, we were living in England then. You know, the kids were born there. We lived uh, at Wentworth, a golf club, great place. Um, so we took a chance with Ben and, and sent him to the same school as Samantha, very close to home. But, um, you know, he didn't react at all. And in fact, he absolutely despised going to school. So Anthony, we should actually ask Anthony because he can tell us exactly how he, uncomfortable it must be for people with autism to then not be able to communicate to us, the, his parents, that, hey, I'm not happy doing this, and I really don't like this, this environment I'm in. And he couldn't um, communicate with us, and me selfishly, you know, sending him there all the time, and I remember, you know, physically having to put him in class and all this, this is really tough stuff. Um, until we started realizing, you know what, let's try and find out what, these, what, it's, what does Ben want, what makes him happy, and, and, and uh, that's when our whole world started changing. And it's because of a school we found in, in Florida. Uh, we used to live in Orlando, and I was looking around to, to maybe move house from England, so we found a place in Palm Beach, and we found a school in Palm Beach, which was a, an old commercial building that they you know, uh, switch into, you know, make room, uh, classrooms and stuff. And great teachers, great environment for Ben, although it's a very basic uh, building. But he enjoyed that, and he started loving it because he was going to his buddies. He was going to a place where he felt comfortable, and he was, he was so at ease, and he started smiling, and he just started opening up. And that's when Liesl, uh, my wife, said, it's time to build something proper, mm -hmm. you know, for, for kids with autism. And, uh, and this is where we are today. So it's really, that's the one that, that's really the tough one. <laughs> I'm getting up to these <laughs> Yeah. Let's get up there. <laughs> I will say, without a doubt, this night would be better for you all if Liesl had my mic on versus me, but I'll do my best. She is a magical woman, I have to tell you, from all I've heard and all I've experienced. Tell me if you would, I read an article about how early on you wondered, somehow it was your responsibility, your fault, you felt like you carried a burden with, with Ben's affliction. Mm -hmm. And then from that feeling to seeing him smile in his new, I mean, yeah, it's life-changing for him and for, for me um, as a father, you know. It's your, your only son and, you know, you've got, you know, different kind of things that you look forward to. And in our case, you know, in my case, it wasn't going to happen. So, you know, and then what I put him through in England, you know, for those two years, you know, I didn't feel good about what, what went on. So, um, you know, I kind of blamed myself for, for some, some of the stuff. But then now to look back and to see how my relationship with Ben is fantastic. We're best of friends. He loves golf. He's not very athletic, but he loves coming to the golf course. He loves being outdoors. He loves people, you know. Um, and he's just, he's just a different, different guy at the moment, you know. And, um, and how the whole family played its part. Samantha. She's got to get so much credit, you know, because for a long time, you know, building our center and raising funds and then you guys putting us on television and, you know, getting the awareness out for autism, you know, she had to play second fiddle as the eldest kid in our, in our house. So she's come through it in flying colors, um, wonderful uh, person and, 
she's going to be looking after Ben when, when we're not there. And, and she says she's looking forward to that. So it's, it's brilliant how things have worked out because of, um, of her sanity you know, with us. Um, so we're very lucky, fortunate, whatever you want to call it, looking back how we came through it. But it's because of the people around us. Right. And Marlene is here, you know, she's our executive director at the school. You know, we got 90,000 square feet, you know, under roof there, capacity for 300 kids, and we have a lot of activity and, and stuff for them. I'd love to, for Anthony to come and check it out when you have a chance and give us your take on, on things there. But we feel we've got a world-class facility for, uh, for our kids. Well, and it sounded like from what Anthony told us in detail his, his experiences at school, what Ben had at an early age. You, you've built almost a refuge. Can you tell us about 90,000 square feet is great. 26 acres, I'm told. And like I said, $50 million raised already. You were given this platform with your exceptional golf skill to do something meaningful in the world more than just the trophies. And you grabbed it, Liesl's vision, you've run with it. What's the school like? How does it help the kids? No, it's, it's unreal. I mean, we um, start at the age of three, and we have them till they're 21. We have two charter schools that run under us. You know, we built the center, we fund the whole thing, but it's, there's two charter schools running, uh, a, a primary school, a lower school, and a high school. Um, but again, at 21, you know, the whole thing stops. The system stops. Um, either the child has to go back into society or go back home or you know, hopefully, you know, uh, they're respondent enough where they can find a job in our society. You know, in our, our little village our, in Jupiter, you know, uh, we create jobs for them and so forth at golf clubs, uh, stores and so forth. But um, we've also got an adult services building that we just finishing now. Uh, June 6th will be our groundbreaking. And that facility is for kids that's um, past the age of 21 going forward that are quite severe and you know, can't quite get into our normal society. But we're going to keep them busy there and create jobs and create an environment for them to, uh, to do what they love. So there's an ongoing process. You know, we, I still want to do Special Olympics at our center. I still want to do uh, track and field and you know, our next project is going to be a Olympic size pool. Uh, we have a little golf range at the back. Um, so we do all kinds of different activities. You know, families come with their, f with their kids and they can be themselves. A lot of times with autistic kids, you know, you take them to a, a public park, you know, the, f the family is a little bit shy because, you know, when Anthony, when, when we get going, you know, we're a little bit louder and a little bit more active than a normal <laughs> family. So people look at you a little bit differently. So we find people a little bit skeptic to go out as a family. So we want to create that environment where they can be themselves. So, yeah, it's, it's all because of what happened to our child. And that's, you know, you throw your energy in there, starting with Liesl and then getting professional people like Marlene and the whole staff involved, and, and there you go. Kind of what you guys have done here. Exactly what we've done here, uh, a different kind of a way though, and when you take a look at the sport that you found your way to, it's one that's just so rife with philanthropy, PGA Tour, PGA Tour champions, Corn Ferry Tour together have given billions of dollars, more than all other tours combined. But that's a drop in the bucket compared to what goes on on other Monday pro-ams and local charities around the world. When you take a look being in the game of golf and having played so many pro-ams and raised so much money for so many other efforts and so many other philanthropies in your career, to then have one that's near and dear to you, what's your thought towards the people who end up giving their time and their treasure and their donations to you and to or else for autism? No, that's, uh, I'm telling you, I'm not sucking up here, yeah? all right? This is he the truth. He doesn't do that. I've, we've lived in other countries, you know, we've lived in the UK, we've lived in South Africa, I've been to many places, but the United States of America, the way you guys raise money and give back, 
there is nobody near you guys. And I believe that is why you're such a great country. It's because you guys give back. And, you know, it's, it's creating that opportunity for the next generation. You know, it's, 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 it's people like sitting around the table here. It's people like yourselves, um, you know, getting involved with, a, with an initiative that you believe in. And, 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 and creating a better life. And, and that keeps happening in this country. I know we've all got our challenges and every country has its challenges. You know, we're not gonna go in there, but what the core of your values is, comes through in your giving back. So we couldn't be where we are with, without um, people getting involved and believing in our, in our mission and our cause. And as you said, we've raised quite a lot of money, which we've put straight back into um, our initiative. So this is another one. I mean, I'm not sure how many kids have come through your program. It's amazing. But it's thousands, it seems like, and it's been going for many years. And there's such a great story behind it, you know, with Eddie Lowry and uh, Francis we met, you know, doing what they did back in 1913. And here we are, a hundred and something years later. <laughs> and, uh, and that story still continues. And you've created something around it, which is brilliant. brilliant. Well, there's a saying, never meet your heroes because you're always going to be disappointed. That does not hold true with Liesl and Ernie Els, does it? Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. 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 Thank you.